Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm Harvey Mansfield, and this is um, a session of the program on constitutional government and our usual uh, uh, Friday lunchtime series. And our guest today is Colleen Sheehan, the um, Irish name, if I've ever heard one. <laughs> is, um, got her, In Perth. Yeah, uh -huh, I'm Perth. All right. Uh, she uh, graduated from Eisenhower College, got her PhD at Claremont Graduate School. She's a professor of political science at Villanova University, where she is director of the Matthew J. Ryan Center. She has, uh, she's a member of the Pennsylvania State Board of Education, and she's uh, been in politics, was, ran for the uh, uh, House of Representatives in the state of Pennsylvania, and won, and then lost. So she's had this uh, universal experience, you could say. In politics, she's the uh, she's a, um, a scholar of James Madison in particular. She's written a book, James Madison and the Spirit of Republican Government, and with uh, Gary McDowell, she's uh, edited um, writings on the other Federalists. There are other Federalist writers besides uh, the one we all know, and she has. Uh, uh, this is not a minor hobby of hers, but uh, a, a strong interest, deep interest in. Uh, Jane Austen, on which she's published, I think I counted five articles. She's working on a book on uh, James Madison and, and the classics, and another one on the ethics of Jane Austen. And she teaches uh, American political thought and uh, politics and literature at Villanova. So all the, with all these excellent credentials, uh, Colleen, why don't you begin? Thank you very Thanks. much, um, Harvey. It's an absolute pleasure to be here um, and to be in the presence of the Harvey C. Mansfield, um, who's um, respected and admired throughout uh, the country and the world. I, I envy all of you for being here and, and able to do these things. And I want to thank um, Anna in particular uh, for your hospitality last night. I enjoyed that very much, and Russ and, and Amy. It was really delightful. Um, you know, but the only thing, Anna, I thought there was perhaps a shocking amount of windows <laughs> in your uh, second period uh, colonial abode. Um, I discovered something on the internet uh, not too long ago. Um, that it seems that the, the Mansfields um, ran into a little trouble with the law, or at least with the historic association of their neighborhood. And it, it, it looks like this actually um, was a repeat of something that happened a number of years ago. I think this was in, um, oh, April 21st, 1811. Um, there was a meeting of the Highbury Neighborhood Homeowners Association <laughs> that it took place at the root cellar of the Crown Inn. And uh, who was present? Mrs. Augusta Elton, Mr. Philip Elton, Mr. George Knightley, Mr. Robert Martin, Dr. Perry, Mrs. Goddard, Mrs. Hodges, Mr. Cole, and Mr. Ford, an alternate. And there were a number of folks uh, who were absent. Um, but you know, uh, Mrs. Elton chaired the session uh, in the absence of the, she's the vice chairman in the absence of the chair. And Mrs. Wallace read the uh, report. It seems that Mr. Harvey C. Mansfield, hereafter at Mrs. Elton's direction, referred to as Mr. M, mm. uh, had work recently completed on his abode and replaced some windows on the first floor and completed a landing for a new entrance. Now, Mrs. Wallace described this house as first period Tudor revival style with a projecting second floor garrison and exposed beams on the facade and described the existing uh, conditions. Unfortunately, their contractor and architect, Mr. John Nash, of some fame at that point, uh, failed to get a permit for the building. Mm. And so a meeting was held of the Highbury Homeowners Association, and Mr. M and Mrs. M had to appear um, before Mrs. Elton and the others. Now, Mrs. Elton noted that Mr. Nash should have applied for a building permit before the work began, which would have alerted the Highbury Historical Commission staff to the job at hand. Uh, 
Mr. Cole stated it was not the responsibility of the window distributor to advise about regulatory requirements. Mr. Elton agreed, adding that it was the owner's responsibility to apply for the proper permits. Mrs. Elton asked whether the bay or perhaps the bow window on the second floor had been installed. Was it not so, named after Bo Brummel, she asked. She, um, and she asked further, what kind of casings and trim the first floor windows had before they were removed? Mrs. Anna Schmidt, Mr. M's wife, said the casings and trim matched the existing on the second floor. The other windows in the house had been replaced in 1807 with double hung windows. Only the first floor front windows remained. She questioned why the grandest room in the house had such small windows. It was, after all, very dark. Now, Miss Woodhouse explained that the Revival-style house was mimicking the small windows of the first period Tudor houses. Mrs. Elton then asked for public comment. Mrs. Weston of 15 Langham Road, a neighbor, read and submitted a written statement which she welcomed and in, in which she welcomed her new neighbor, Mrs. Anna Schmidt, and urged the commission to approve the application. She said it was unfortunate that the architect and contractor did not pull the permit until the work was almost finished, but it would be very costly and onerous to change the windows now. She asked the commission if they would be friendly to the new homeowners. And Mrs. Wallace noted two other letters of support from uh, Mrs. and Miss Bates of 24 Bates Street and Mrs. Ford of Ford's haberdashery. Now, Unfortunately, Mrs. Walton said if the owners had applied before the work had begun, the commission would have certainly encouraged them to use the proper replacement windows. She said that was not as, she was not as concerned about the change in the style of the windows because it was not a high style house. Architecturally, indeed, the house stood testament to a shocking lack of high Tudor taste and trim. <laughs> Mr. Elton agreed, exactly so, he remarked. He noted that much of the first floor was obscured from view due to the fence and the landscaping. He was concerned that this would not be an example to encourage other people to think it was acceptable to do work without a permit from the Highbury Historical Association. Well, <clears throat> the meeting continued, and Mrs. Elton said she had the same concern as her Caro Spozo. Other people would expect similar results. She hoped the district would, re would retain architectural integrity of the buildings. Now, but if the Mr. and Mrs. M were to go in this much, uh, uh, this unfortunate modern style, perhaps they should change the other things in their house and get rid of the first period Tudor style and in fact go in an entirely different directions. Might they cons consider that? And use organic materials, of course. Uh, Mr. M said, it was just an ordinary Tudor-style Tudor uh, house with a bay window. I think he had few other comments during the evening. And so the conversation continued, and Mr. Knightley pointed out that it really wasn't the job of such historical commissions to tell people how they, should how they should change and alter every aspect of the house that they were living in. And finally, the meeting uh, came for the moment to a close because Mr. M said perhaps they would apply for a new permit in the future, that they would be away for the summer on, uh, on vacation, at which point Mr. Woodhouse uh, hoped that they were not summering in South End or in Bath. Um, I don't know if any of you have had the pleasure to um, uh, have a look at um, what Mr. and Mrs. M have gone through <laughs> in terms of their neighbors' comments and um, slight intrusion into their pri private property and life. Um, but now I understand why you began with such an exaggerated praise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. E would certainly have understood um, I want to talk just a, a few minutes today and leave lots of time for conversation uh, about this wonderful novel, Emma. Um, Emma, uh, Austin once said, is a heroine whom no one but myself will much like. 
the um, the novel Emma um, has a plethora of themes in it. Education, I think, is is one of the major themes of the novel, um, especially moral education and how one ought to teach um, such subjects and how one learns such things. Uh, the imagination is a major theme in the novel, but also the question of the senses, which things are actually senses. Are there five senses or are there more than five senses? There's, of course, a, a parallel in the novel to Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream, which Jane Austen actually quotes in um, volume one, chapter nine of the novel. The course of true love never did run smooth, she writes. And then she remarks, a Hartfield edition of Shakespeare would have a long note on that passage. And in fact, Austen's Emma, the novel itself, is a long note. It's a long footnote, it seems to me, on Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream. Also in the novel, are, um, it's a presentation of differing views about nature, about what nature is, what constitutes it. There's a theme of friendship in the novel. It's, it's really remarkably developed in terms of different kinds of friendship. I don't know if we'll have time to get there, but if, if we do, that would be interesting to discuss. One, another theme of the novel is who or what is, a, is, is the gentleman. And finally, the novel is packed full of games and diversions. There are puns, double entendres, charades, acrostics, anagrams, um, and uh, they start around this chapter nine in volume one and continue uh, right until the end. Um, I like Emma Woodhouse. I think she's one of perhaps the smartest, the cleverest of all of Austen's heroines. I think the, the one uh, other heroine who could, obviously Elizabeth Bennet, but Emma might even have it over Elizabeth Bennet in some ways. Mary Crawford. Is, is very bright and very clever. Um, though I don't know, um, well, I mean, I personally don't like Mary Crawford as much as I like Emma. Uh, the novel Emma concerns a particular kind of education, the formation of moral character and of practical wisdom. Now, um, Jane Austen tells us early on in the novel that uh, Emma's education is incomplete, uh, uh, to understate the case. Uh, Emma's lived nearly 21 years in this world um, with little to distress or vex her. And at the start of the novel, she has, uh, as, as uh, the young people would say today, she's clueless <laughs> um, that she's in need of anything at all. In fact, she lives almost in uh, an autonomous world. She, she barely thinks she has a need for anyone or anything until, of course, Miss Taylor leaves, and she's, she's in jeopardy of becoming very bored with this lively mind and without any real system of, of work that she does. She creates lists, right, of books to read, but doesn't read them. She says she's going to practice the pianoforte, but, you know, sits down for five minutes, and that's the end of that. But nonetheless, at the beginning of the novel, the dangers, um, were not unseen by some of Emma's friends, though they were to, were to her. And at one point, Mr. Um, Knightley and Miss Taylor, uh, recently having become Mrs. Weston, uh, are talking about Emma. And they wonder, what will become of her? And we all wonder, what will become of Emma? I mean, Emma could go more than one way, couldn't she? Um, because she's... She's vain, she's handsome, clever, rich, and vain, but her vanity is not about her personal self. Um, it's about her abilities. She is not, she's been mistress of Highbury since she was probably six years old, or mistress of Hartfield, and she's intent on becoming mistress of Highbury, and she wants to control and command everything and everyone around her, including at the most fundamental level of the marriage between male and female. Emma is spiritedness, I think, writ large. Um, and she can't help herself. I mean, her she's youth in full bloom. She's beautiful. She has all, nature has given her everything. 
and we don't know what she's going to do with it. So Austin tells us early on that um, uh, that Hartfield, um, at Hartfield, the course of true love will run smooth. Uh, and so Emma becomes a matchmaker, right? And like in Midsummer Night's Dream, the matchmaker in Midsummer Night's Dream is uh, Puck. And Puck is one of my favorite characters in, in all of Shakespeare. But what Puck does, if you remember, he takes the dew do from the wild pansy. And when Oberon directs him to um, put that on the eyelids of another, when they wake up, they will fall in love with the first person or thing <laughs> that they see, right? So Oberon has Puck take the dew of the, the magic pansy and put it on the lids of Titania. So when Titania, the queen of the fairies, because Oberon is jealous of her, she has this little changeling child. And when, when Titania awakes, the first um, person she sees is Bottom, who is just as his name sounds. Um, his head is actually his ass. And Titania falls madly in love with him. She can't see anymore what is before her, the dew. The magic do is her imagination. It takes over. Her senses no longer operate in this world. Um, now, of course, how that the, the magic pansy received its magical powers is Cupid one day who was shooting his arrows, and he missed, and he hit this little white pansy, and his arrow hit it, and it bled and it bled that purplish red color. And those are, that's the wild pansy that's sometimes called heart's ease, or we, some, we call them Johnny jump ups, or love and idleness. Um, and that's a flower that, that Puck takes the dew from and sprinkles on, on the eyelids of others. Um, I think Emma is Austin's Puck. She plays multiple roles from Midsummer Night's Dream because she, of course, wants um, Elton and Harriet to get together. And so she plots and plans uh, their marriage. But of course, Elton is not at all interested in Harriet. Elton's is interested in her. And she's not interested in anyone. So then when that doesn't work out, uh, she resolves she'll never do this again, but probably within a few hours, she imagines Harriet with Frank Churchill. Uh, unbeknownst to her, who is secretly engaged to Jane Fairfax, whom Mrs. Weston, she gets work, she, she teaches her governess, Miss, Mrs. Weston, to um, live in her world of her imagination. So Mrs. Weston imagines that Jane Fairfax and Mr. Knightley will get together until Emma finally realizes it's only herself. Uh, that can can uh, win the heart of, of Mr. Knightley. So everything is upside down, backwards, and bottom up, um, which is one of the themes throughout the novel. Winter becomes summer when they're on Box Hill. They're on Box Hill, by the way, on Midsummer's Day. It is midsummer. It is so hot out that tempers are flaring. And that's where Frank Churchill and Emma suggest that they play games. And Mrs. Uh, Elton says, that's something you do in the winter by the fireside, not in the summer when we're out of doors. But the novel is like that. Everything is turned around um, and backwards and bottom, bottom up, just as it is in Midsummer Night's Dream, because that's the power of the, of the um, boundless imagination, where Shakespeare says, even the seasons change their wonted liveries. And Knightley is the, the only one, of course, in the novel who will tell Emma that, that she has anything to learn. And in um, volume one, chapter nine, he remarks to her, and this is on the handout, if you were as much guided by nature in your estimate of men and women and as little under the power of fancy and whim in your dealings with them as you are with these children, where these children are concerned, we might always think alike. So Knightley's setting up this um, distinction, perhaps opposition, between, on the one hand, fancy and whim, or imagination, right? And the imagination is but a waking dream. You know, that's what is Shakespeare is showing us in Midsummer Night's Dream, and Austin is showing us in this novel. And 
Knightley juxtaposes that with nature. And so um, we need to think about what, what it is that he's getting at there, what this opposition is about. Um, well, Emma is so, uh, lives in the world of her imagination to such an extent that she not only thinks she has absolutely nothing to learn, but she doesn't even need to use her senses. She doesn't need to look at what is right in front of her. When they play that charade in volume one, chapter nine, and Emma's qu so quick she gets it right away. Well, it's court and it's ship, right? And there's Harriet, slow, dull-witted Harriet, guessing such things as mermaid, shark, Neptune, Trident, and Emma says, no, 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 Harriet. But of course, it turns out um, Harriet is actually being rather commonsensical about the whole thing and talking, you know, what would be the monarch of the seas? Neptune, shark, mermaid. Um, that perhaps comes closer to at least one of the answers to the charade. But Emma says in, um, uh, in Austin says in volume one, chapter 14, and this is on your, on the handout, Emma wished she had been alone with Mrs. Weston, who would scarcely try to conceal anything relative to the Churchills from her, accepting those views on the young man of which her own imagination had already given her instinctive knowledge, unquote. Um, Glenn Beck once called, uh, not Austin books, but he called Austin um, films, bonnet movies, bonnet movies. Um, I think if he and perhaps others who have that view would, would read some of these novels a bit more closely, it would say that there's much going on uh, below the surface. We don't know all of what Austin read. Um, we know some of the things, uh, partly because her sister Cassandra, to whom she wrote, so many of her letters um, decided to destroy most of them. Thought they were private and decided to destroy most of them. And Austin herself, um, you know, sort of poo pooed her, um, her understanding, uh, particularly when she was asked to, by that silly man, James Cl uh, Stanier Clark, to write this novel that was really about him. <laughs> and she said, well, you know, she wasn't a philosopher. Um, we do know that Austin's father had a very extensive library, and I cannot believe that Austin wasn't down there reading everything that interested her. Um, she just had a voracious appetite and curiosity. You know, in Pride and Prejudice, when um, Lady Catherine de Bourgh is grilling Elizabeth Bennet, um, uh, who taught you? Do you have a governess? Did your mother teach you? And Elizabeth says, no, no governess. Five daughters, they're all out. You have no uh, governess. Your mother didn't teach you? And Elizabeth says, no. She says, but we had all the masters that were necessary. They had books. They had books. Um, and I think that's uh, what Jane Austen had. So this novel shows us a little bit, however, of the things that she seems to have read or certainly was familiar with. Um, so what were some of those things? Um, if you go to number two that I've entitled Education and the New Systems of Morality, I want, I want to see if you re remember this on Box Hill when they're playing these games. Uh, and Mr. Weston comes up with a game. And he says, um, let's play conundrums. And everybody's in, you know, a foul mood to begin with. No one's getting along. The parties are all divided because, particularly because Frank Churchill and Jane Fairfax are feuding. The split, the feuding. Yeah, they're quarreling. The quarrel started the day before at Donwell Abbey at the strawberry party. Um, but Mr. Weston, who is the sociable fellow, right, of the novel. And, and that's another thing that's really interesting to watch what she's doing there. She loves to do that kind of juxtaposition. Mr. Weston is overly sociable. He never thinks a party uh, can be too big. And so, for example, he, in, he constantly is inviting more and more people. Whereas Mr. John Knightley, 
Mr. Knight, Knightley's brother, thinks a party can't be too small. One should not be, one shouldn't go out of one's house. One should stay put, particularly on Christmas Eve. Um, and so there's this question of society and sociability, right, versus living in retirement. Well, on Box Hill, Mr. Weston, the, the, the sociable one of the, of the crowd, um, says, let's play conundrums. What two letters of the alphabet express perfection? And he says, oh, you'll never guess. He, and then he looks at Emma and he says, you, Emma, will never guess. Get it? M and A equals perfection. And Mr. Knightley says, he, he says, perfection shouldn't have come quite so soon. <laughs> You know, because, of course, Emma's not there. Well, what does that refer to? Well, um, a fellow named Mark Loveridge uh, pointed this out a few years ago in, a, a, in Notes and Queries, that, in fact, that's the formula of Francis Hutchison. This Francis Hutchison's formula for moral perfection. Um, he has this theory of moral perfection that he uh, puts into a, a mathematical calculation, and I've written some of it down there for you, and it, it's from an inquiry into the origins of our idea of, be of beauty and virtue. And he taught that M equals the moment of good and A equals the ability or agent. And when you put these together, you have moral perfection. This is Hutchison's uh, moral sense. And the moral sense is a sixth or seventh sense, depending on how you count. He has a number of senses above the five. Um, at first, he claims he follows his teacher, Shaftesbury, um, and even Addison, and that um, he's really not creating something distinct from that. But as time goes on, Francis Hutchison really uh, wants to talk about this moral sense as, as autonomous. Um, and so Austin at Box Hill makes a joke about that. But of course, for Francis Hutchison, that autonomous moral sense means that um, knowledge is instinctive. You don't, you can know it, it's innate, without using your senses. And she's making fun of that. Um, another thing that she makes fun of in, in Emma uh, is this um, woman's uh, novel, uh, Madame de jean in, who writes a novel, uh, uh, Adelaide and Theodore, which is a novel about education. But instead of it just being about the education of a male, which is made popular by Rousseau, right, in the Emile, she wants to show you the education of both a male and a female. She doesn't want just Sophie sent away and then brought back to fulfill um, Emile's desires. So she has Adelaide and Theodore. Um, and and uh, Austin has Emma make fun of that when she says to Mrs. Weston, who's just had uh, her new baby, she says, well, now you'll have a chance, right, to educate someone else and to educate uh, your new little girl on a more perfect plan. Um, well, Madame de Jean Lee's plan of education, she thinks she's critiquing Rousseau because she doesn't like his plan of education for girls, but essentially she follows Rousseau. I mean, I, I've read Adelaide and Theodore. I don't highly recommend it. Um, it's, it's very time consuming. Um, it's very repetitive. Um, it's written in the epistolary form and and uh, we find that you have to take the children out of society, right, into a kind of retirement, a country living, um, because society's corrupting, right? And you don't want to have uh, someone chiding the children. There are no no's in this education. Dijon Lee is, is uh, Madame Dijon Lee is following Rousseau, a kind of a negative education, where you let nature do its work. Now, behind all of this, the governor or governess is manipulating everything, right? So that it seems like they're not involved, but, but like Rousseau as the governor of Emile, uh, he's very heavily involved. He's actually rather tyrannical, it seems to me. Um, think about that for a minute, that, the way Rousseau sets up that plan of education. Emile is an orphan, right? I mean, he's got to get him sort of before he's been affected by parents or by society. What would you name the female counterpart of a meal if you had a chance? And would you make her without a, a sort of an orphan? Maybe 
Emily or Emma, something like that. Um, Emma doesn't have a mother. She has a father who doesn't act the part of a father in any way whatsoever, and she has a governess whom she is mistress over. <laughs> Emma is in absolute control of everyone and everything at Hartfield. And the novel Emma itself is full of these orphans or parentless children, right? Jane Fairfax is an orphan. Now, she's brought up in a very different way than Emma with the Campbells. She has a, a kind of traditional education. Then you've got Harriet Smith. We don't know who Harriet's, Harriet's parents are, but once again, Emma um, decides that she knows. <laughs> Harriet's parents must be royalty. <laughs> Um, and that's why Mr. Martin, Robert Martin, uh, just a lowly farmer, isn't at all good enough for Harriet Smith. Frank Churchill, his mother dies when he's young, and he's given up by his father, Mr. Weston, and goes and takes the name and is adopted by the Churchills. So when he's spoiled at the Churchills, unlike Jane Fairfax. Now, at Mrs. Goddard's boarding school, where Harriet Smith is, um, Austin writes this. And this is volume one, chapter three. Mrs. Goddard was the mistress of a school, not of a seminary or an establishment or anything which professed in long sentences or refined nonsense to combine liberal acquirements with elegant morality upon new principles and new systems and where young ladies for enormous pay might be screwed out of health and into vanity, but a real, honest, old fashioned boarding school where a reasonable quantity of accomplishments were sold at a reasonable price, and so on, where you could send away your girls and not be in any danger of them coming back prodigies. What are these new systems of morality? New systems of morality. Um, well, this is a debate at the time um, in which Austin is living, right? There's this in this. French influx into England of these new ideas, these Rousseauian ideas particularly, um, a, a very different way of looking at nature. Rousseau wants um, the avoidance of the formation of any habits, right? And no discipline and no teaching of moral principles and so on. And then you've got somebody like a Hutchison who says, who has a different way of teaching because these things are uh, instinctive. Rousseau's system, um, this negative education, you learn experientially. Um, and of course, there are educational systems today that, um, in which uh, people place their children. I think Montessori is, is a little bit like that. But colleges are doing this too, right? This is, this is a new craze of service learning. Don't teach people things from books, but have them go out and experience these things, and that will become the basis um, of our education. So um, Austin is, is looking at this question of whether we can acquire knowledge independent of reason, whether it's innate, uh, whether nature should be shunned, um, and whether these things, there, there are new systems and new principles upon which to look at these things. What Austin does is make fun of these things. But she also wants us to think about it. And she juxtaposes these new, uh, this new system of, of education with an old fashioned one that she mentions in Mrs. Goddard's boarding house. But we also see it in the character of Mr. Knightley. How does Mr. Knightley show um, a very different way of learning? Well, remember when they're at Randall's for Christmas Eve? I love this scene at Randall's. It's snowing. It's snowing at Randall's on Christmas Eve. And of course, Mr. Um, Woodhouse, who's um, been an octogenarian all his life, <laughs> um, he panics. It's snowing. And Mr. John Knightley is rubbing that in. Oh, we'll never get home. We'll all have to stay here. And of course, that makes Mrs. Weston pan panic. She doesn't have room for everybody. But Mr. Weston thinks it's fine. Um, and Isabella's pa panicking because her children are back at Hartfield. So Isabella, the fretful one, and her father, they're both nervous types, concerned with bodily self-preservation. Um, well, they're never going to make it home. 
And Mr. John Knightley says, oh, it'll be fine. There are two carriages. So if one tips over, there'll be another. And so Mr. Woodhouse is on the verge of a heart attack. The whole house is in an uproar. Horror of all horrors, it's snowing. Mr. Knightley walks outside, walks just beyond the sweep, comes back in, and after observing with his eyes exactly what is going on, what is before them, he says, there's not even an inch of snow, and we have plenty of time. We'll pack up now and get everyone home safely. The situation is solved. Mr. Woodhouse doesn't have a heart attack, and everyone gets home uh, safely and no carriage is overturned. And the same thing, of course, happens between Jane Fairfax and Frank Churchill. Emma's imagining, you know, um, uh, Jane Fairfax and Mr. Dixon. I notice in, in, in your town here you have a, a place called Dixon Brothers. <laughs> it's spelled slightly differently, but Austin loves to play with those homophones. So, um, and of course, the whole time there's a secret engagement, which Emma is just absolutely clueless about. She doesn't see any of this that's right before her. And at one point, Knightley, there's, there's a passage where Knightley, Knightley says he'd seen a look. He'd seen more than one look. He knew there was something going on between Jane Fairfax and Frank Churchill. So Knightley um, observes in terms of using his senses. I'll just mention um, one other thing, and, and I want to... Um, sort of bring this to a close because we can talk about these other things that we don't get to. Um, when Miss Bates goes on in these monologues, I think those are there for a reason. <laughs> I don't think those are accidental. And we have to pay, it's hard, but you have to pay attention to what she's saying. <laughs> I mean, that's a whole point that you, you sort of tune them out. But one of the interesting ones, um, happens to be in the central volume, the volumes divide, the, the novels divide into three volumes. And in the central volume, volume two, in the central chapter, there's a long, long monologue by Miss Bates. And it just is not ending. So it takes up a lot of time, which we're meant to see that it's a lot of time. And this whole play on the senses, um, you feel like the monologue takes place in the Bates' household because it's all about what's going on in the, in the Bates's household. And it's about the new pianoforte that Jane has received, and no one knows who, who it's from, right? Um, and it's Patty who's got to get the chimney sweep because the chimney is smoking. So you're imagining um, this, this house full of smoke, and you're having trouble breathing. But at the same time, there are all these apples from Donwell Abbey, and they're, they're making baked apples. And so there's this, this, this burning smell of the chimney, and then there are these apple tarts ready to be eaten and tasted. And then, of course, poor Mrs. Bates, her spectacles are broken. And she can't, she can't hear anyway. And without her spectacles, she's blind. And so Mrs. Weston and Frank Churchill go to visit the Bates. But Mrs. Weston and Miss Bates decide they're going to go over the, across the street to Ford's where Emma and Harriet are. Emma's, or Harriet's taking forever picking out some ribbon. And they actually go over to Ford's, and that's where the monologue takes place. So there are five senses, and four of them are emphasized. And there's one that's not mentioned. And the one that's not mentioned, okay, you see there's sight, there's hearing, there's taste, and there's smell. And there's a sense that's not mentioned. And who's left alone at the Bates's? Well, there's Mrs. Bates, who can't hear or see. Frank is supposedly fixing the spectacles, but it's Frank and Jane, whom we know, if you read it a second time, are secretly engaged and there's a sense that's not mentioned. And they are left alone for quite some time as Miss Bates is over at the Fords. With, there's actually two monologues, but they're right next to each other. Um, ultimately, how does Emma learn? Emma is sort of a Rousseauian Emile who has a negative education. There's not a lot of manipulation going on, but she's certainly left alone to, to discover things for herself. Um, 
And, but she, she gets herself into some trouble. And each time she does, she resolves never to do that again. But her resolve in the beginning is pretty weak. She's not going to match make again. And it's almost immediate when it doesn't work out between Harriet and Mr. Elton that she's on to the next thing. Who else is she going to set Harriet up with? Um, it takes quite a while for Emma to change her bad habits, for the resolutions to actually um, take effect in her life. You know, that's what education is, isn't it? At least in an old-fashioned sense, in a, maybe a Lockean sense or an Aristotelian sense. It's a lot of work. <laughs> um, uh, and it, it takes the formation of habit in the, the changing of one ways. We were talking about this last night, Russ, but I mean, Emma finally gets to, from incontinence to continence, and you can follow her through these stages in the novel. And the word resolve, the words resolve and resolution are mentioned over and over again, and you see it strengthening finally, until the, the climax of an, the Saratoga of Emma is at Box Hill. This is the turning point of the novel. You know, when, when Emma insults Miss Bates and Knightley points it out, how cruel she has been, truly cruel to their neighbor, Miss Bates, who is not her equal. You know, um, the question is, um, they're playing this game, and everyone has to say um, one very clever thing, two moderately clever things, or three things dull indeed. And Miss Bates says, oh, I'll go first. I can certainly say at least three things very clever and or very dull indeed. I can probably say, and Emma says, oh, pardon me, Miss Bates. There may be a problem. You're limited as to number, only three at once. And Miss Bates says, ooh, I guess I should hold my tongue if I, she gets it. Emma um, has been cruel. And Knightley says to her, I must talk when they, they get away before they leave and they're ready to descend Box Hill. I must talk to you while I can. You, you know, you have hurt her, Emma. Badly done, Emma. Badly done. And Emma is finally humbled. Finally, she sees what she has done. And as she's, the carriage is descending Box Hill. That's where they did the Olympics, the Summer Olympics. They were, the women were riding the bikes around Box Hill. She descends Box Hill. And I went to England a few years ago, and I went down there. I wanted to see it. And there's a little train station. There's nothing there. There's a little hamlet, and there's Box Hill. You go up Box Hill. And the sign, there's a sign for Box Hill slash West humble. That's where Emma is humbled. Um, and so at the end of the novel, just like in Midsummer Night's Dream, it's a comedy. The, the author has every right to m make it all work out perfectly. And um, uh, Emma and Knightley, of course, are married. And Hartfield is just a small little property. It's like a notch, she told us early on in the novel. It's like a notch in the Donwell Abbey estate. And of course, these are united together. So that which is heartfelt is united with that which is done well. And, um, and, and uh, Austin ends her novel about um, the imagination and um, the, 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 the uh, world of the imagination, the power of the ma imagination with, she tells her nieces and nephew when they play those games of um, the alphabet letters that there was a third set of, of letters, right, that Frank gives to Jane Fairfax, and she pushes away after he'd spelled Blunder and Dixon. There's a third set. We don't know in the novel what it is. But these stories, Austin would continue with her nephews and nieces afterwards. They, they, these characters had a life of their own. And that third set of letters spelled pardon. Gentles, do not reprehend. If you pardon, we will mend, as Puck says in Midsummer Night's Dream. Thanks very much. Done well. So <laughs> what can we what can we say? 
Amy. I, I wanted to thank you for, I really enjoyed your presentation and your, you're a very careful reader and it really helps me rethink a lot of the things about the novel. I've always been divided between Mansfield Park and Emma as to which is her real masterpiece and I've gravitated more towards Mansfield Park because it's, I had more of a handle on it and I, it just really helped me to think about a lot of things, especially about the education of women. Um, but one of the things that, besides Emma, the character of Emma and the fact that she is like Austin and Shakespeare, they are consummate matchmakers. That is their job. <laughs> That's their the business that they have. And they fill people with all kinds of imaginative nonsense, as, Harriet, as Emma does with Harriet. So Emma aspires to be something that Jane Austen is. <laughs> um, so that, and you're pointing out the, um, the incident in Box Hill with the name, Emma's name, I think is very helpful. Because I've always wondered why this is the only novel that's named after the heroine of yeah. the novel. And this, by Austen, you, you point us out to the fact that Austen ties this together with female perfection and the question of what, what perfection is. And, and because Emma has these, not only Emma, but Jane Fairfax and even Miss Bates, because they are the, the foils in a way to Emma. They're, they're the ones that irritate her in the novel, but um, they have some aspects of Austen, because Miss Bates is this old maid, and, uh, Emma, and Emma is considering what she may choose to be an old maid and what mm -hmm. that would mean, and, and this bothers her in some ways. But also Jane Fairfax is this woman who um, hides her thoughts behind common opinions, and she's very hard to read, and, and some people may approach, they may think of Jane Austen in that way in some sense. I mean, Jane Austen clearly had thoughts that she hid, even in her writings, as you show through, even through her puns, and there are things that she had. So I, I think that Emma does, the fact that this is a, a novel that is very complex treatment of education from the point of view of self-knowledge. Mansfield Park focuses more on religious principle and that relation between principle and reason. Mm -hmm. And this novel really brings out education, self-awareness self and self-knowledge. And, and I think, I really thank you for helping me to see a, a lot of that. And I wonder what you th thought, if you've ever thought about why Emma is the only novel that um, is named after the heroine. Well, I think you nailed it because, I mean, it is named after the heroine, but Emma, M-A, Emma, is also a riddle, <laughs> right? I mean, the, the title of, of the novel is a double entendre. Um, and she's playing with all, all these games and, and riddles and charades and acrostics and anagrams and so on, right? Um, think about, I mean, is that just fun? Yes, it's fun. It's a play within a play. Look, she's got the Shakespeare play within, the, she's got playing within the Shakespeare play within this play. Um, does that have anything to do with what she's doing with this question of education and a method of education? Well, it's her way of doubling back on, on us, the readers, right? I mean, because Emma can't see what's right in front of her. Miss Bates can only see what's right in front of her. She says so. I can only see what's right directly in front of me. Um, Emma can't see. She's blind because her imagination has taken over. But Austin plays, the, they're all playing these games, but we've got to watch out because Austin is playing those games on us. We become part of the, um, of the novel itself. We have to play these, Anna. We have to figure out what she's doing. She's like on Box Hill. She doesn't tell us. We've, people at the time who read Hutchinson would have known that. There might even be a few people who read Hutchinson today and would, would see it. But, but a lot of the things in there we don't see. The games themselves are a way where she's not um, exhorting us about moral principles. She's asking us to see for ourselves, to pay attention to the world around us, um, and to discover ourselves when there's an incongruence, right? Um, there are games of, and Shakespeare does this too, right? You flip things around, and you make, uh, you make a discord 
Shaftesbury likes to talk about this. He calls this a, 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 the way you learn moral philosophy. Um, I think I put that, that quotation on here from um, Shaftesbury, where he says, um, so I don't get it backwards. Uh, the world, however it may be taught, will not be tutored. And Austin is sort of doing that. That's her method of moral education is to get us to see for ourselves, get us to see when there's a discord, a disharmony, uh, when, when things are um, incongruous. Uh, so for example, Knightley has no gallantry about him. Gallantry is, is the young man who smiles so often and bows so well, right? That's Frank, but Frank is not Frank. <laughs> And she's just playing those kinds of games um, all, all through. Uh, I mean, I think that's what she's doing, too, with the Prince of Wales. I mean, I, Austen hated the Prince of Wales, the Prince Regent. She despised him. She writes that letter um, to uh, her friend and says, I hate him. Look what he's done to uh, Princess Caroline, right? Um, he was... In a, he was um, he was a glutton, a gambler, an adulterer, um, and the caricaturist just had a heyday with the Prince Regent. But she dedicates Emma to him, and she had to get back at him. There is no way Jane Austen would let that go. There's, it's not in her character. It's not in her constitution to let that go. Well, in that, sh in that sh um, little charade in Volume 1, Chapter 9, if we look closely at it, we see that Harriet almost nails it. <laughs> it's not mermaid or shark or trident or Neptune, but if you if if you look at it, um, and that's the the one little short piece I handed out to you, lampooning the prince. Is the in the picture? And that's the Cruikshank print. That see this stuff is in is is all being printed. Then this came out by Cruikshank. It's called the Prince of Wales or the Fisherman at Anchor. And you see how Wales is spelt. He's a big guy. The prince is a big guy. And this is based actually on a poem by Charles Lamb called "The Triumph of the Whale," which is just uh, an absolute. It's 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 a long poem um, that goes after the Prince Regent. Um, and the very end of that poem, I put it in that little piece I gave you, if you have it. I don't think I have it here with me. Um, but um, it's about the Prince of Wales, spelled W-H-A-L-E-S. If you look at that charade in Volume 1, Chapter 9, um, um, my first display is the wealth of pomp of kings. Um, behold him there, the monarch of the seas, right? What she's doing is down the side of each uh, of those sections is an acrostic, but you have to anagram it. So it's a complex acrostic, and those are some of the games she's playing. And each one spells lamb. And the the author of the poem about the Prince of Wales, W H A L E S, is Charles Lamb. Um, and then Cruikshank made this caricature based on Charles Lamb's poem. Now, people were getting put in jail for saying these kinds of things. So you had, to, you couldn't be too obvious about it. You had to bury it. You had to hide it. You had to be like Frank Churchill. You had to be a little bit secretive and deceive. You had to let people discover it for themselves. Um, there was a, uh, two brothers who were put in jail for a couple years for making fun of the Prince of Wales as an Adonis. <laughs> they made him into this beautiful, I mean, he was, he was, he wanted to call himself the first gentleman of Europe. And he didn't uh, cotton well to um, any kind of criticism. So she plays these games and these puns and these acrostics and anagrams so that it's not just the characters playing them, but we have to play them. Because what does that teach us? It teaches us self-discovery. We have to discover things for ourselves. Um, and we discover in, in that, that way of, of going about things a better awareness of the world. It's a mode of learning. We'll be taught, but we won't be tutored. About um, going back to Amy's first point, uh, um, connecting Emma to Jane Austen and Shakespeare as matchmakers, a non novelist as a kind of matchmakers. 
matchmaker. Um, what, what are the considerations that go into um, matchmaking? And I, I notice also that the uh, the very the novel ends at the very end by calling uh, uh, Emma's match with uh, with Knightley a perfect match. <laughs> and, and one, one thing that seems to be absent in matchmaking is love. Uh, people fall in love with uh, someone who's not suitable, uh, not a suitable match. And, um, well, let me what, turn what the question on you, Harvey. Yeah. Do you think, um, do you think... You've turned enough on me. <laughs> <laughs> do you think, as many people do, that um, Emma wasn't the proper cho choice for Knightley, but that Knightley should have chosen Jane Fairfax, that she was a better match for him. I wouldn't second guess him. Ah. Right. Right. <laughs> I, not, I don't feel I'm in a position. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I don't know. Yeah. But Because um, Jane Fa Fairfax, I mean, she's, she's so elegant. She's talented. She's beautiful. Um, and she doesn't have all of Emma's faults. And Frank Churchill gets her. Mm -hmm. um, now, Emma doesn't make that match. Um, that, it, that's a match of love, right? So what goes into matchmaking? Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. You mean when it's done well or done ill? Yeah. Well, why does, he, why does she call this a perfect match? Isn't it part of the point that Jane Fairfax completes Churchill in a way that he's very lacking, and that it may be a better match for him than for her, but somehow the whole is much better. And everyone knows that. Yeah. Right. And for same for Knightley and Emma, perhaps, that there's a way that her wit and imagination and fancy complete his English empiricism. That, that the whole together, just as with the land, is very... Very good. So there's a compliment. Right. Yeah, yeah I mean, um, the match is much better for Frank. And he knows it, too. Everyone knows it, including himself. He says, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a child of good fortune. Um, and it will elevate him. And Jane Fairfax has to be careful that it doesn't do the opposite to her, right? But she seems to be a pretty strong character. But nightly, when Mrs. Weston tries to set up in her own mind, Knightley and Jane Fairfax. What is it that Knightley says about Jane Fairfax? I mean, he, he thinks very highly of her, right? But she's too reserved for him, right? And that's one thing Emma doesn't have is reserve. Um, and it's not simply because of her secrets. Jane Fairfax is a, is a quiet, reserved lady. And so, there's part of that that's um, a je ne sais quoi, isn't it? It, is, it isn't just about, simply about character, though. It is about that, because friendship is a theme, very much a theme in this novel, friendship. And in, in Midsummer Night's Dream, Shakespeare says something like, um, and you know, this is the problem, once again, of the imagination, that um, uh, reason and love keep little company nowadays. Tis a pity some uh, good neighbors won't make them friends to bring together, you know, the head and the heart, passion, um, reason and love. Um, but it can't be just one or the other, right? I mean, the, he puts the, the two together here. Alan Bloom wants to argue that Jane Austen is a romantic, right, because of, of love. Amy's shaking her head. Because um, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's quite accurate to, to, to see Austen that way. Certainly there's love. And it's not just this coldness. But I don't think um, in, a, in the kind of understanding of friendship and, uh, based on character that Austin has, e any more than Aristotle, that it's just a, a, a sharp um, coldness. Remember what she says about uh, Mr. Knightley? And I think she says this about John Knightley, but Two Knightley brothers have a certain amount in common. You know, there's, there's a, there, there is that reserve about them, right? Um, they're not great talkers on little things. 
Um, and so you can get a feeling from them of a kind of a distance and um, maybe a lack of emotion. They don't, they're not um, like Frank Churchill, who's, you know, obsequious and, and out there and flattering and complimenting everyone. And, but she says, you know, in, 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 these, in this type, the feelings are most retentive. And so um, uh, that kind of love that's at once a passion and there's something, there's a depth to it that has to do, I think, with very much a classical idea of love, which is absolutely full of passion, but it's full of passion not simply because it is, but because it's a love of something that is worth loving. And I think it's those things that she brings together. I don't know, what do you think, Amy? Is that... I, I, I definitely agree with you that she's not a romantic and I mean, sense and sensibility kind of illustrate her, her distance from Rousseau and her wanting to re-educate young female, male novel readers about the, the importance of tempering, uh, concern with love, with, you know, what, what is, should love guide your life or should reason guide your life and clearly she wants to bring reason into the equation. And I'm not sure that love, that love has to be absent from Aristotle. Because in the highest kind of friendship, why couldn't that friendship, even though it might rarely happen, why couldn't that friendship not just be between, for example, two male friends, but between a male and a female? What um, theoretically stops that from being the case in Aristotle, that kind of friendship? The, the third kind of, and each volume in Emma, by the way, takes up one of these kinds of friendship. The first one is a friendship based on usefulness, and Austin is absolutely explicit about it, that when Miss Taylor leaves, Emma says she's going to be useful to Harriet Smith, but in fact, it's particularly Harriet Smith who's useful to Emma as a new walking companion to take up her time and give her something to do. She adopts her and educates her, or thinks she does. And then, of course, in volume two is the introduction of Frank Churchill. And that friendship is based on pleasure. They are enjoy each other's company. They're both lively and witty. And there isn't much of a compliment there. They're, so, they're really, in many ways, a lot alike. And then finally is the potential friendship of Emma and Jane Fairfax are equal which might have happened if Jane Fairfax hadn't moved away, but wasn't ready to happen until Emma um, went through a certain process of moral education so that she deserved the friendship of Jane Fairfax or even of Mr. Knightley, ultimately. Well, it would seem like the question about friendship and love would depend upon to what degree we think of ourselves as embodied and to what degree we think of ourselves as more than human. Right, than embodied in a human sense and complementary in uh, our bodies sexually and in, in uh, marriage and childbearing uh, and how much is about the union of, of logos and speech and reason and mm -hmm. so forth. But I guess what I was wondering was which is connected if we say all right we won't peg Jane Austen as a romantic is it right to say kind of on the other pole of classical thinker, writer um, here. And I, I guess I come back to, again, the analogy that you brought up so nicely with Midsummer Night's Dream, that there it seems like the moral education that takes place is both a check to spiritedness, and the spiritedness at the beginning with Theseus and uh, Hippolyta, the spiritedness among the you know, misdirected lovers uh, mm -hmm. throughout the play, uh, but then ultimately also a check to Eros, too. That seems like the, you know, the overwhelming message here is of how misdirected Eros can be, how at both the individual human level as well as the level of the cosmos um, yeah. uh, between Titania and Oberon can be. Um, that there's a kind of, um, there's a kind of teaching, it seems to me, in the play that gives pause to both um, Eros and spiritedness, and maybe both are somehow two sides of the same coin um, that Bottom's dream captures. But there's Which no bottom there is here. no bottom, <laughs> there's right. There's no bottom, bottom there's here. Bottom. None of the senses The eyes can cannot it. hear, right? Right, yeah, you I can't can, capture I mean, all it All the at senses all. are. Right, then I wonder if there's something, if, would you say there is something similar in Austen, or would she not go that far? Is there a kind of completion to human life that 
that love captures that we might say Shakespeare causes us to back away from accepting, to say that love, uh, that Eros completes our lives. Uh, I don't think we could just simply agree to that based on something like Midsummer Night's Dream. Say a little bit more about why you think Shakespeare backs off of that and Austin goes in the opposite Well, I, I'm, not, I, I, I'm not trying to claim it, but I'm, I'm wondering if yeah. it, there is a, a difference there. Um, that in the play, it seems as though by being a dream, the play itself is a dream, it was announced at the end, within the play, there are the dreamers, Within the, that, their dream, there is this kind of central dreamer of Bottom himself, yeah. and his dream is bottomless. Right. Um, that the, the world of the play is one that is suffused by a kind of, um, I don't want to say mystery, but there's a kind of incompletion to it all that we can't penetrate, um, that causes us to take a certain distance from the characters, the action, and so forth. Not to, not to be, well, in one, in some ways, the play is extremely exciting, right? And you get caught up with it, and that's why it gets so shown all the time. So the wall goes down at the end, right? Right, but it all goes down. <laughs> the wall goes down, yeah. and there's a union of the lovers, right? There is, but there, there's a union of lovers that we as spectators can feel some distance from and not be caught up in their dream, right? We can awake from it. Is there an awakening in Austin from the dream of love? Or is there, in a way, yeah. ultimately, you are drawn in to see that the fancy and the imagination of love is satisfying for human life? I'm not sure that in Shakespeare that we have to awake from the dream of love, that it lacks um, the power to complete us. Um, I'm not sure that there's a, a, a disagreement on that. I suppose it under it depends on um, what the nature of that love is, right? And I think both plays, or the play and the novel, are to a certain extent about tempering passion, love, the madness of that, um, um, the hallucinogenic <laughs> kind of of love, with a certain kind of reasoning. But that um, the reasoning, certainly in Austin, I don't think it's just cold and calculative. Um, and the imagination isn't just a bad thing. It's not just the enemy, right? Because that's that dear part of Emma, too, her imagination. And in some ways, we fall in love with that. But, but um, I mean, we wouldn't be human without our imagination. For, for as much damage as it can do in our lives. It's the imagination that makes the poet, right? Um, but it can't be imagination without the love, right? I mean, that, that has to be there at the same time. I think Austin sees that in Shakespeare. Um, I don't see her disagreeing about that as much as, obviously, um, you know, Shakespeare's not not thinking about simply the senses versus the imagination in the way that it, it comes to foreign philosophy in the 18th and early 19th century. But in a way, he's almost um, um, preempting that. I mean, he's, he's got this setup, right, of the, the, those who use their senses and those who ignore the senses and use their imagination. But the theme of love is love and passion, or passion and reason, love and, and, and reason, is very much a theme of Shakespeare that I don't think one or the other wins in the end. I think the idea is to bring together the heart and the head, which Austin loves to do in many of her novels. But it's not just a balancing act. It's not just Eleanor and Marianne, sense and sensibility, simply balancing each other. Um, there, is, there is the ruler, one is the ruler of the other, right, in the human soul, which doesn't take away from love or passion. It gives it um, its true home. Um, and if you look at this one print I, I, I gave you, and I, I need to get a bigger print of this myself so I can study it more because it's so incredibly complex by the famous caricaturist Gilray. But this is called um, The New Morality. And if you look way to the right, this is the part of these new systems of morality. There was a fellow named George Canning who wrote um, a poem. He was a prime minister for a time. 
And he's talking about this, and, and then Cruikshank made uh, a character based on the poem. And in George Canning's poem called The New Morality, he says, um, never comes a gentler virtue, ah, beware, lest the harsh verse her shrinking softness scare. Visit her not too roughly, the warm sigh breathes on her lips, the teardrop gems her eye. Sweet sensibility, who dwells enshrined in the fine foldings of the feeling mind, with a delicate mimosa's sense endued, who shrinks instinctive from a hand too rude, or like the angelus, prescient flower, shuts her soft petals at the approaching shower. Sweet child of sickly fancy, her of yore, from her loved France Rousseau to exile bore. And while midst lakes and mountains wild he ran, full of himself and shunned the haunts of man. Well, if you look to the right, you will see these three statues. And on the bottom of the one in blue, it says sensibility. You can't see it all that well, but there's a book in his hand. Can you see what that says of the book? says Rousseau. <laughs> who, who, who are the other, t who are the two uh, statues um, on the, to her right, or to Sensibility's right? Right, one is called Philanthropy, and I can't see. And she's um, squeezing the world with, is that Africa in her? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But Charles Lamb is actually in here, and there's a toad in here somewhere, and that's Charles Lamb. I mean, the whole thing is just full of, it's what George Canning is concerned about is the influx of French philosophy and morality into England. Into, remember when the, at, they go to Donwell Abbey and they, they, at the Strawberry Party, and they walk down, they see Robert Martin. Yeoman Robert Martin's Abbey Mill Farm. And there's, there are pillars there. And it looks like you should come to some great picturesque prospect. But all it is is Robert Martin's Abbey Mill Farm with the smoke coming up because the work is being done. It's English culture, English character, English verdure under a setting sun. Emma is a book about the sense and character of, as Austin understood it, of, of um, English principles and not French principles. I think, um, you know, Frank Churchill likes to use, well, remember when, what Knightley says about Frank Churchill? Emma, your young man can be amiable. Uh, but he's not, he's, he's, he's not amiable in English, he's amiable in French. You know, it's a superficiality, this sensibility, rather than the solidness um, of the character. And, and it's not aristocrat versus democrat, which I think a lot of people reading Jane Austen make the mistake. Austen has a great respect for Robert Martin, the yeoman farmer. I, I mean, Knightley shows us. I mean, Mr. Elton, who thinks he's so much above a Harriet Smith or a Robert Martin, is bottom. He's an ass with his parade of speeches, right? And his caro sposo and his exactly so. Caro sposo. <laughs> and of course, Mrs. Mrs. Elton um, pronounces it incorrectly. She gets the gender all wrong on yes. it. Um, and, and her puppyisms and she her. She wants the donkey. Oh, right. <laughs> that's a perfect example. So when they go to Donwell Abbey, she's going to be lady patroness, right? She's going to organize it all for Mr. Knightley. She's going to come on a donkey with a basket on her arm and a ribbon. Um, and they're going to explore like Rousseauian Bohemians, right? In nature. And Knightley says, I think we'll do nature my way, like gentlemen and ladies with a cloth laid out in the dining room. Um, so he'll have none of her return to a, a kind of savage nature. Pretty much uh, soon after this, some, some pretty bad English principles are coming up <laughs> after, with Jeremy Bentham. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Uh, it's been a while since I've read the novel, so my, some of my 
question is about my faded memories, but my question is about uh, Emma's education, and I'm curious in terms of, well, you mentioned a possible connection with Emil, and I'm curious about what what we know from the novel about Miss Taylor's education of Emma, and because it seems like, well, Emma's imagination is clearly sort of runs out of control, um, and so I'm curious as to what role Miss Taylor might have, may have had in that, if we, if we have any sense of that, and then the role that Mr. Knightley plays in seeming to to counteract that, because the the quote that you have here in the of Knightley to Emma on the first page of, of contrasting nature, being guided by nature versus being guided by fancy and whim, sounds a lot like Rousseau in Emile in terms of the, yeah. I guess Bloom translates that as something like Caprice, I think, in, in his translation of Emile. But, so I was wondering in what respect Knightley can be seen as as trying to educate Emma and and then so if, if there's anything there, then you'd have this sort of weird scenario where, in this version of it, Rousseau marries Emil at the end. Um, <laughs> it seems sort of strange, but maybe yeah. I'm reading too much into it. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very good question. Well, I don't think Miss Taylor is, she's kind to Emma. She cares very much about her. Um, we learn early on in the novel that nature gave Emma understanding and Miss Taylor gave her principles. She tried to teach her certain principles. She tried to encourage her to read and practice. But she's not very successful at it. Emma is her own mistress. And really, the two of them are like sisters. Um, and that's probably why Emma misses her so much. I mean, that's her, her best friend. Um, Emma is just a lot more clever. And just, she's just, she just has it all over, Miss Taylor. Um, they are good friends. Emma, Emma educates herself, which she doesn't really take a lot of pains to do. So Knightley is the only one who will point out to her from time to time any failings or things that she might think twice about. Um, but he's not, I don't see him as manipulative like Rousseau. I see Rousseau as tyrannical and manipulative. I mean, Rousseau in, in the social contract, um, uh, discourse on inequality, that's one thing. But when I read Emile, I wanted to throw that book. I mean, he is such a tyrant. He's manipulating everything behind the scenes, and it's all deceptive. And then he sends Sophie off and brings her back so that, you know, um, and he suppresses Emile's, right, imagination um, so that there's, there's none of the, you know, ill form of, of pride, only to bring it back so that, as Alan Bloom puts it, imagination, you know, um, takes the throne because there's no love or justice or morality in this world. We have to create it ourselves. And we do that through some notion of the ideal and the imagination. Well, Knightley is standing exactly against that kind of idea. He thinks these things can be discovered in nature. Nature to him ought to be the guide for human beings, that that's how we come to understand who we are, how we ought to live. Um, and probably it's our best guide. Um, but the imagination and fancy is, he loves that about Emma. I mean, it's not a rejection of that, but it's understanding that in the context of the other parts of the human soul and our faculties, I think. So it may be that, I'm just trying to think of it from Rousseau's perspective, that uh, Emma reading all these books when she was young. Or very few books, actually. Uh, yeah, or starting a lot of books. That may, that may have affected the the, I guess we could say, lack of self-control of her imagination with regard to spinning out these tales about the, the matchmaking and so forth is where she's running you know, 10,000 steps beyond reality in her mind, which, I mean, Rousseau and Emile would just say, well, that's the result of, I think he would oh, say, it's the result like of reading. Oh, we like romances and yeah, so Yeah, reading on. too many novels. Romance and, of the forest and... Right. Hmm. You know, if that's true, um, we don't know that about Emma. We don't. She seems to be familiar with *Romance of the Forest*. That Harriet Harriet has, is reading these kinds of books. We know. Um, I don't. I mean, they're making these little albums of charades and and games and poems and so on. 
I don't know that Emma was a great reader of, of Gothic novels. Like we do find that in Northanger Abbey, you know, that's one of the themes, right? Um, but but maybe that's where, where Emma's becoming run away with her imagination, or maybe it's just, maybe she just can't help herself. She's just by nature that this is a kind of spiritedness and liveliness about her. You know, and, and, and Knightley um, wonders at one point, I mean, he sees this all in Emma, and there's that um, sighting of Cooper's poem, The Task, Myself Creating What I Saw where human beings become their own creators of their world, right? And, and, and Emma, too, I mean, it almost works the way it works for uh, Emile. Um, some writers on Emma have talked about this, that obviously her imagination is not suppressed, but her, pro her and, she does, and, and, and she does want to control everybody and everything around her, so that part hasn't worked. But there is a suppression of her sexual energy. She seems to be autonomous and asexual. I mean, she can't imagine herself in love with anyone. She can only imagine manipulating their lives. And so everything for her is sort of channeled into um, how she's going to control and dictate things around her for quite a while. And Knightley says, you know, one of the things that would be good for her was if she were in love without any um, certainty of a return. And that's what does finally happen with Knightley himself. Oh, well, that's related to what I was going to ask, which is um, you haven't said so much about the particular feelings of Emma toward Harriet, what it is. I mean, it's true in a way she's kind of controlling, dictating, and on the imagination side, she's obviously terribly misjudging what's going to be beneficial. But just, I mean, it seems like that's, in a way, the strongest passion that Emma has for so much of the novel is this feeling toward Harriet of wanting, I mean, isn't it? wanting to benefit her, to shape her, to educate her, and it's a kind of, it's a pretty consuming passion. It's sort of the closest thing she has to something like being in love, it seems like, is what she's feeling toward Harriet. And it, I just wonder, it seems like Jane Austen is partly exploring that passion, you know, the role of that passion in friendship and love, um, you know, more so than I can think of anywhere else in her novels. And, and I mean, you raised this question about, you know, why didn't Mr. Knightley end up with Jane Fairfax instead mm -hmm. of Emma? I mean, it seems like the, the most, at least one of the obvious points would be that, that Jane Fairfax doesn't really have any need of Mr. Knightley, and it's, it's good to be, to be needed to, to benefit mm -hmm. someone else, to shape mm -hmm. someone else. And, you know, if you have two people who, who don't, you know, mm -hmm. they can respect each other, but they don't really need each other. Um, so I just wonder this, this sort of passion for it benefiting, shaping, um, but you think that's part of what's going hmm. on there? Well, I, I guess that, that's, that's very interesting because that would be part of what you were saying earlier about complementing, you know, as opposed to, you know, it's this idea of opposites attract in some ways, right? I'm not sure that Emma has benefited Harriet Smith, at least according to Mr. Knightley. He, she doesn't. Yeah, it's not she's that been she no does. friend to him. No, it's not that she does, but that she wants. And so I think we have to ask ourselves: Is is that what Emma's about? Um, is that it's this Rousseauian benevolence for Harriet Smith, where she will do good um, and be useful, as she says, to Harriet Smith. She'll sort of adopt her, bring her into good society. Um, is is that what she's really trying to do? I think that's suspect because she needs so much to, she's lonely. She's there with her father in Hartfield when, you know, Miss Taylor becomes um, Mrs. Weston. And she is bored and she has no way to even walk down the, to walk into Highbury because a young lady needs someone else to walk with. And so Austin plays with those words, usefulness, all throughout that volume one of, with Emma. And, um, I'm not sure that she has this love for Harriet as a friend that's much beyond how useful Harriet can be for her. It's not a cruelty, and it's not simply um, the kind of usefulness that really doesn't care at all about the other person. She feels badly when she finds out Ellen is actually in love with her because she set it all up and she knows Harriet's going to be upset. She says, well, maybe I should be like Harriet, and she says, oh, no, it's too late in the day to become simple and ignorant like her. Um, and at the very end of the novel, in volume three, 
Austin tells us that after she'll accept Robert Martin, the marriage with Robert Martin, and that's fine, but their friendship, such as it was, will dissolve into goodwill, which is what Aristotle tells us, those kinds of friendships that aren't the, you know, the highest kind of friendship based on character or virtue, especially based on usefulness, that um, they don't last long, and at best they dissolve into goodwill. And so Emma really isn't Harriet's friend in the end. She wishes her well, um, and she doesn't. So I'm not sure that, I think she's a project. I think Harriet is a project for her. Um, and it gives her something to do, and it gives her a chance to exercise her powers of making things happen in the world. Um, it seems like her drawing the portrait of Harriet at the beginning is emblematic of the relationship, that Harriet's a projection of, of Emma's and a sign of her poetic, mimetic ability that, that she can make this, this project, make this accomplished young woman out of nothing. I have a question for all of you. This um, is going to be the last question. The, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, as some people see Mr. Darcy, who's you know, proud, right, and, and pride and prejudice, whether his pride is proper or not, is Mr. Darcy the magnanimous man, or is Mr. Knightley more the magnanimous man than Mr. Darcy? And whichever, I mean, where, where does Mr. Knightley fit into this? Because Austin describes how he walks, how he talks, that he can't stand to hear himself complimented. Um, he has to ride away from Miss Bates's window because he, you know, he, he deserves honor, but he's not going to stand there and listen to it. And there are all kinds of examples throughout the novel of that. But his name is Knightley, and he lives in an abbey. What is going on here? Well, um, uh, whatever's going on, we have to stop. <laughs> <laughs> and, and thank you very much for this very absorbing talk. Yeah. Thank you very much.